and welcome. And we're not quite ready to get started yet. We're going to give it a few minutes for folks to join. I wanted you to know that you're in the right place and we'll be getting started shortly. If you're just joining us, we are going to give it another minute or so for folks to join and then we'll get started. Before we get started, I might ask my co-presenters to temporarily mute themselves just to cut down on any potential background. And I want to thank the Associate Deputy Director for Grants to States. We are doing something we have a number of years, which is a webinar on the State Program Report, or SPR. We have some new and exciting things that are happening this year, in particular in the SPR, and we wanted to make sure everybody was on board with them. And we're just gonna take some time towards the second half of the presentation for a general refresher with some high level tips. So if you're an expert at the SPR, there's a few things here to hear that tend to be pitfalls and pratfalls. So we're gonna try to uh, make sure everybody's being the most um, efficient and be as they report. So I'll ask Dennis um, to advance the slide. Just as a reminder, everybody that is an attendee today is in a muted status, a listen-only mode. If you want to ask us questions, if you have any technical difficulties, please use your question box. We have access to that here. There will be a few dedicated pauses in the presentation for questions. So we probably won't answer them on the fly as much, but we will try to stop and make sure they get answered. And as a reminder, we are going to record today's webinar. A view of content that we're covering today is just to remind you of the upcoming reporting deadline. We're going to talk a little bit about the couple of systems that we have at IMLS that can create some confusion around where you should be submitting your reports. We want to be sure that for the Grants to States program, things are coming into the SPR. We're going to talk a little bit about modification that we've in, in, um, rolled out into the SPR that will allow you to add some new contacts. And um, probably the marquee topic of this webinar, we're going to talk about how to report your CARES Act funds this year and how not to report your CARES Act projects this year. So please stay on at least through that part of the presentation. And then we're going to get into a refresher and general best practices uh, segment on the state program report. So next slide. Okay, so as a general reminder, um, and this doesn't change from year to year, the Grants to States program um, year generally, it's September 30th, which gives you 90 days to then report your projects and your financial data. So most of the states, that means that your report deadline is December 30th. There are some exceptions for the states that came in and asked for extensions. So you know who you are, but for most of the states, it's fast approaching. This year, what you need to submit by December 30th is your 2019, your federal fiscal year 2019, financial and narrative reports. So those are the projects that you spent with your 2019 allotment. 
and the financial data associated with that, as well as your admin project. Uh, this year, you also report your sort of midway financial, um, kind of minimal financial data for your fiscal 20 allotment. And that also is the year we disseminated the CARES Act award. So you will be reporting on full 20 award and the CARES Act award in this year's interim federal financial report or interim FFR. And we'll have a few more screenshots on that in particular. If you cannot meet your reporting deadline, whether it's December 30th or you have an extension, it's a bit later, we, we really need you to let us know before December 30th or before your reporting deadline that you're going to need some kind of reporting extension. Um, that is different than a extension. It's just for the purposes of getting your report in, but we still need you to communicate with us. We can make some edits on the back end of our systems so that you don't get automatic alerts that you are suddenly delinquent. Um, so we really top of that, but we do depend on you to tell us that you need an extension. And since it's an official communication with us at IMLS, ideally it would come through the EGMS reach system as a message to us, but if you send us an email, we will make it happen. So just remember to be in contact with us if you get close to the reporting deadline and you can't get your authorizing official to certify and sign off on it or something of that nature. Next slide. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Madison. Thank you, Terry. I'm gonna start off my portion of the presentation with a reminder as well to submit your report into the SPR not EGMS. And this is for only grants to states program awards. Again, you'll be submitting them through the SPR. I'll be repeating that a lot today. Next slide, please. As you all know, just over a year ago, we implemented our EGMS REACH system, uh, which is our electronic grants management system. And it's for IMLS as a whole. Significantly, EGMS Reach is the new place where you can manage your payment requests and send official grant communications and generally manage your award. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. There we go. Uh, now, we've shared this slide with you before, but for the purposes of this presentation, you can see here some specific instances of when you should submit a message in EGMS Reach or when you should just send your program officer an email. We want to highlight again that when it comes to uh, reports for the Grants to States program, you will submit reports in the SPR. Uh, once reports are approved in the SPR, we will uh, then review and do some record keeping on the back end uh, and put those reports in approved status so you don't need to worry about them in EGMS. Uh, but this slide is a great slide to keep for your records just to give you some guidelines on what to send in EGMS and what to send in as an email. And as always, uh, for quarterly grant accrual reports, you'll always wanna submit them through email to the quarterly grant accrual email address. Next slide, please. Here's another slide that we've shared with you before about EGMS reach. Again, due to the nature of LSD allotment awards, uh, we generally will not use that forms and reports tab. Um, if you go to that tab, it will display your reporting schedule, but again, submit in the SPR. Uh, and as a reminder, we are also not using the change requests tab, um, and that's for LST awards only. Um, but we're about to look at where you can manage contact changes, um, which is within the SPR. Next slide, slide please. So now we're gonna move into the SPR and show you some additional contact field updates. Uh, specifically in the state info form. Next slide. So the SPR includes a form for updating your SLAA contacts. Uh, this is called the state info uh, when you log into the SPR. Some of this information flows into 
verifying your report, but it also includes other contacts, such as your LSTA coordinator and fiscal officer. We made a few changes to this form this October, including a last modified date stamp, uh, which you can see circled here. Very excited about this. Next slide, please. And since you're already required to keep the SPR form updated, we also use it to maintain contacts in EGMS Reach. With this system launch uh, last year, we learned that many states needed multiple fiscal contacts in order to process drown, drawdown requests. So the SPR info form, info form now includes two other fiscal officer fields. Uh, and this is in addition to the primary fiscal officer. If you enter new contacts there and then alert your program officer, we can add these fiscal contacts to EGMS Reach. And we recognize that some may already have EGMS Reach credentials. Uh, but if you specifically request it, we can also get these folks SPR credentials, but that's only if you request it. Uh, we are working to push notifications that would alert us automatically when this form is updated. Uh, but for now, please continue to email your program officer when you make changes to the SPR state info form. Next slide, please. So here is what we've accomplished this year in terms of SPR infrastructure updates. And we hope to turn to more of the user enhancements in the next coming months. Um, but as a reminder, we're still using Wednesday evenings as a maintenance window to push new updates to the SPR. Now I'm gonna pass it back over to Terry. Thanks, Madison. And I'll just say a lot of the infrastructure updates we did were um, in response to problems we've had in the past with groups losing data out there in the states. And so we're really hopeful this year that we've got a nice solid platform for you to work in and shouldn't be losing data in the ways that we've sometimes had little hiccups in the system in the past. All right, so we're gonna turn to what we want you to do this year around your fiscal year 20 allotment grant and your carriage funds. So next slide, please. Okay, so as a reminder, at any given time, you have multiple awards going um, in the Grants to States program. And this slide we put together to help visualize this because it's sometimes hard to conceptualize. So right now, the report or the fiscal award that you are gonna report on in its entirety with all the project data, um, talk about your admin project and put a financial status report together, that big package that's getting certified is for 2019. Um, it ended this past September, and we are now in the 90-day reporting window that you can see in the dark gray block on the top of the slide. At the same time, you have an open fiscal 2020 award, and that was the same year that we issued your CARES Act award. So the CARES Act award is running in parallel with fiscal 20, but for this year in the SPR, the only pieces of that that you're going to report on are represented in the interim federal financial report. So it is only a little bit of financial data to help us see that you're tracking your funds, they're getting spent, but it's a very high level report with no narrative details, no titles, nothing specific until next year. As you can see with the dark gray and the dark orange box on the screen, you will not be reporting on the 20 um, award and the CARES Act award in their entirety, until next fall and leading into December. So I just wanna clarify that and we'll do it a few more times before we're done. Next slide, please. Okay, so what you are gonna report on for CARES Act and fiscal 2020 is in the form in the system known as the interim FFR report. And we have done a few tweaks on our end to accommodate the financial data and there's a few things that you're gonna to have to do too. So the first thing we'd like you to do is when you get to the part of the form that says federal grant or other identifying number assigned by federal agency, normally this would be a single number, a single number that you would see on your grant award. Well, this year it's gonna be two numbers because we wanna see both the number associated with your fiscal 2020 allotment award as well as the number that was associated with your CARES Act award. 
both those numbers are going to take the format LS hyphen a six digit number hyphen OLS hyphen 20. And by 20, you will know that it was issued in the year 2020. So both of them have the 20s on them. You can find these numbers um, in EGMS if you haven't seen them before. If you are an authorized user in the EGMS system, then you can drill into your award area and look in your documents tab and you will be able to check your official notice of action, which is the jargony way of saying your award document. And that will have the federal award ID number near the top, that LS number. Um, so we want to have you drill into both of your awards, the CARES Act award and the Fiscal 20 award to get those numbers and then plop them in the interim uh, FFR separated by a comma. So that's thing number one. And then next slide, we'll talk about the financial data. As the slide's loading, and I think I have some slowness on my side, there it comes for me. Uh, we have done some back-end auto calculation adjustments on our part, and so some of these numbers will be pre-populated in the report. Um, the first bullet here is one of those examples. The total federal funds authorized um, is now a combination of both your fiscal 20 allotment award plus the amount that you received with the CARES Act award. So it is a total sum number that will auto calculate into that field, which is illustrated on the bottom. It's the top of the fields that's illustrated in the picture. You will then fill out the next of the fields, which um, is the federal share of expenditures. And so you will tell us of those two awards, how much did you spend in total? So you also will have to add those two numbers together if you spent funds in both your fiscal 20 allotment and in your CARES Act award. So we want a combined total of both of those awards spending in that box. There is also a total recipient share required field. Uh, that is your match. And since CARES Act doesn't have any match attached to it, that still only reflects the amount of match that you'd see in the allotment table for federal fiscal year 2020. Um, so that should also be auto calculated and not reflect anything above and beyond, like with CARES Act. The last thing I want to say about these auto calculation fields is that when we deployed the change earlier this fall, they did not automatically populate into everybody's interim FFR. In order for you to see these changes, you have to first open and save this report. Uh, right now, you're not going to see the right numbers. You're going to be confused when you look at it for the first time but just hit save and then refresh the form. And if for some reason at that point, the correct numbers don't populate, then you can let us know and we'll look into it. But we have seen a few states already um, accomplish this and the right numbers are showing. So just to note that they're not there right away, but they, they are secretly there. They are ready for you, just hit save. All right, next slide. Okay, and as a reminder, you will not be entering your project data for CARES Act this year. We realize that some of you have rapidly deployed projects that may have already finished, but the CARES Act award period doesn't technically end until next September. So that means we don't want to see any reports about it until next year. Now, if for some reason you've already entered CARES Act project data in the SPR under the fiscal year 19 area, don't despair. Uh, you can still open your fiscal 20 award instead, which is where we want those projects represented, and you can copy in a project from the prior year, from 2019. So theoretically, you can take that data and just copy it in to fiscal 20, keep it there instead, and then go back to fiscal 19 and delete it out. Uh, if your program officer sees that you have CARES Act data reported in your fiscal year 19 report, they will be sending it back for you to delete those projects. So just a heads up, um, and also if you put financial data in, it rolls up into the financial status report and it will throw off your numbers because this year all we want to see is the federal share around your fiscal 19 allotment grant. That's it. We don't want any CARES Act funds coming into the picture this year except through that interim FFR, which I just um, described in the last set of slides. 
You may still have questions. You can let us know in the questions box or you can follow up individually with program officers. Um, but I'm gonna pause here for a minute and see if there are any just general clarifying things that we can clear up right off the bat. I'm looking at the questions box. And if we don't catch them now for some reason, we have another pause or two for questions in a later part of the presentation. I'm gonna say, because I'm not seeing any immediate questions, why don't we continue with the presentation? Um, keep your questions coming and we'll make sure we get them answered. So next slide. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Dennis. All right. Who is the guys of IMLS webinars today. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. Uh, so um, this is the portion of the webinar that will shift from the kind of new CARES Act centric information that um, is kind of important year specific updates. And then we're gonna be moving general overview, information, refreshers, um, other kind of general principles. This is good for anybody who um, might want a refresher as this year, obviously, has been um, a bit of a whirlwind, it might be helpful, or anybody who um, might be using the SBR for the first time. So the first thing you do, obviously, um, is logging in. And so um, the, your IMLS program officer can um, set you up with an account if you don't already have one. Um, and if there are other um, people in your state library who need access to help um, add project information, let us know. And um, we can also add um, those accounts as needed. And so uh, if you are logged in, but you've received a temporary password from us, uh, there is an area in the account management section of the SPR that lets you um, change that password to whatever you want it to be. Um, there are Im some important technical notes related to the SPR system as a whole. Uh, Chrome and Firefox are the recommended browsers. We have found that they're is some um, inconsistency with using other browsers um, when entering SPR data. And um, perhaps most importantly, we want to urge you and remind everybody not to have two browser windows or tabs uh, for the SPR open at the same time. Uh, this is where we find a lot of data is lost. Um, if, if you have one project edited in one tab and then you open another tab to edit something else, uh, that data doesn't necessarily always sync and um, save. So we just wanna make sure you're not losing any data. So as a best practice, um, just keep an eye out on how many tabs you have open when you're using the SPR. So um, if you're a first time user, one of the uh, first things that you should be doing once you're logged in is to navigate over to the account management section of the SPR. There are three um, areas within the account management section that are of particular interest. We wanna make sure that your user info is accurate. Um, when we set you up with an account, we don't necessarily provide every piece of information. So if you have additional um, information to add, that would be um, extremely helpful. And then um, on behalf of your entire agency, being sure to review the state info section. Um, if, you're a new, if you're a new LSTA coordinator, you may need to go in there and add your name in place of your um, predecessor um, or even those outside of your role at the State Library that may have changed. It's important to make sure that uh, that information is up to date. And then um, thirdly, if you're a State Library that gives subgrants, um, this is often a, um, an often forgotten section of the SPR, but still really important. It's the uh, sub-award info um, section of the SPR. Now this exists outside of a particular project, so it's not in the project lists. Um, it does, as you can see from the screenshot in the slide, it does account for a fiscal year. So every fiscal year, we expect it to be updated with the appropriate information. And um, what's helpful about this is that it gives us a bigger picture of um, of your subaward process, the number of applications compared to how many were actually funded, so on and so forth. So it's really um, especially helpful for us to kind of get a, a greater sense of what your process is like. So 
So now I'm going to um, shift gears from the SPR system itself and some of the behind the uh, under the hood kind of technological pieces and get into um, some general tips with the actual sections of the SPR itself. Um, and we're going to, um, I'm going to hit some broader topics and then later on, um, Michelle will dive into some of the more nitty gritty specifics. So the first thing, um, I want to talk about related to general the general narrative. So um, across the different sections of the SPR, you'll see various fields that I'll ask for some narrative information. So that's the general description of the project, um, the abstract, and then the activities have abstracts, and then you have project outcomes at the end. Um, and so what we would like to see and what um, is is the most effective is to think about the entire project report as a whole, thinking about all of the sections of the SPR and how what you write can be unique to that section. So um, don't feel the need to um, copy and paste what you've said in one section. We'll read the whole thing as a whole. So it's really um, especially helpful and succinct for us to um, read unique information in each section. Uh, we recommend and ask that you use plain language, um, avoiding acronyms and jargon. Uh, this is especially helpful for um, for those of us, uh, not for those of us, for an audience that may not be necessarily in your state or even in the library world, because um, as many of you may already know, this um, SPR report data is publicly available once we accept it. So be thinking about that larger audience. Uh, be sure to write in the past tense sometimes, and understandably so. It's um, we we get some narrative information that was pulled from maybe an application, and so it still has a tense of we will do this or we plan to do that. But if it's happened, and since this is a final report, we hope to see it in the past tense as it's already been completed. Uh, for when you're talking about folks that were involved in the project, use position titles and not staff names. There's a number of reasons for this, but um, the primary one is privacy uh, considerations, but also it helps to understand what that person's role was that was involved in the project. And then uh, this is a big one. For those of you that have projects that um, exist and reoccur year after year, we ask that you think about what made this particular year unique with your continuing project. Maybe there was a sudden increase in participation, or maybe you had a user survey and the results of that survey changed the way you approach the project. Those things are really, really helpful pieces of information to help us understand um, what you're doing to kind of actively uh, address some of those uh, things in your project year after year. For abstracts, um, again, abstracts are intended to be uh, sort of like a movie trailer for the rest of your project. So uh, concision is welcome and is key. And um, again, especially for recurring uh, projects, finding out or identifying for us what you did specifically this year, um, rather than just doing a general program description. Uh, and what we're also looking for is, since we're looking at this project as a whole, if you um, discuss an activity or the purchase of something or any sort of any sort of funded activity, we would expect to see that narrative description reflected in the budget and the subsequent activities. So what's nice about it being a top level abstract is you can just hint at it and then we can see the details later in the budget and activity section. And ironically, we're going to use a bullet to tell you not to put any bullets in your abstract. Uh, and so hopefully that will <laughs> stick in your, in your uh, mind. And um, again, as, as much as possible to pay attention to formatting and copying and pasting. A lot of times with the SPR, you will um, paste from Word or some other, some other document and it'll carry with it some formatting. And so what we found is that there are some ways to work around this. You can use Notepad if you're a Windows user and copy and paste it into there first. That strips any formatting out 
before you paste it into the SPR. And then the SPR um, itself also has a button that allows you to paste without any formatting. So that really helps because any formatting that is pasted in will show up in the public view as well. Dennis, as you're advancing the slide, there were two questions that came in on this abstracts topic that I just want to surface while we're on the topic. Um, Rachel Cook asked, is first person okay to use in the report or do you prefer third person? And similarly, Cindy Boyden asked, can we use we in the abstract when referencing the awardee like we did X, Y, and Z? Hmm. Um, and I would say we see both. We see both third person and the sort of collective we. I don't think we see as much I, like I did this or I ran this great program. So that might be something to avoid if you have a project director who's couching everything in the first person. I don't know if my colleagues have anything they would like to add to that. Yeah, no, I, I would agree. I think we we certainly makes more sense than I. I mean, uh, you know, with so many of these, there some of them are case by case, but it would be interesting for it to be justifiably one, a one, a single person show uh, for a lot of these projects. So no hard and fast rules, but yeah, I, I think that we um, is appropriate and acceptable generally. Great, I appreciate the questions. So uh, the next um, topic that we're gonna discuss is statewide projects and what is considered a statewide project. Uh, the um, So I'm referring to a section of the SPR that asks, was this project statewide, yes or no? And so these are some uh, quick uh, bullets that help kind of frame that and remind you of, of when to consider it statewide and when not to. Um, so one of the main areas is if the entire state's population is a potential beneficiary rather than a specific and smaller target audience. Um, and so, you know, a lot of these, uh, the most common statewide projects are the ones where you can easily say every library and every population in the state has equal access to this thing. So um, statewide databases is probably the most glaring example of this, but in other situations, it could even be summer reading support if it's statewide um, and if it's available to everybody in the state. Uh, typically, the statewide projects are administered by the State Library Administrative Agency, and um, and if the statewide effort supports one single intent, it can be reported as one project. And so, again, using that database example, uh, that would be an easy thing to identify as a project. Now, there can be a few activities within that within that project if there was staff time. Uh, dedicated to it in addition to maybe some equipment acquisition and those kinds of things. But um, but that's that's kind of the, the fine line with whether something was statewide or not. If, if you are targeting a particular area or region, then it wouldn't be considered a statewide project and then you would identify um, locales and beneficiaries um, at that point. So um, we get a lot of questions about consolidating sub awards under one um, umbrella project, um, and rightfully so, because um, many of you would like to uh, report as efficiently as possible without, without a huge list of, of projects. And so um, the guiding principles with consolidating sub awards is if you have individual sub awards, so not the total sub award initiative, but individual sub awards of $5,000 or less, they can be combined together in a single project. And again, if you gave out um, 35 $4,000 sub awards, then they could easily be combined into a single project. So it doesn't have to be a cumulative um, less than 5,000, but they should support a single intent because again, that's how the SPR program works when you're reporting projects is that we're expecting it all to align to one intent. Um, and they should cover the same subjects and uh, target similar beneficiaries. And um, so again, that, that helps make it a very, it allows you to organize really cleanly that they might be separate awards, but they were all contributing to um, a similar subject and intent. So 
if you are have a question. Um, let me see really quick. Apologies for the multitasking. Ooh, there's a few. Uh, <laughs> maybe we should take a breather for see, see these questions really quickly. If a project, uh, Susan Whitney asks, if a project benefits a specific age demographic throughout the state, it's still considered statewide, even though it is really only a targeted at one demographic. Um, I, I, I would say yes. Uh, I think the key piece here is it's available statewide. Traffic is a piece of it, but then um, if it is uh, only available to a, a select amount of libraries in a particular region, then it wouldn't be considered a statewide project. It would still, it would be targeted to uh, a handful of recipients. So the the um, the specific age demographic is a component, but there's the, also the element of is this available to every every library in the state? Okay, let me look at the other questions. Uh, Amy's asking if the subawards are over five thousand dollars, they cannot be combined. Um, I think now I can. I don't want to speak on behalf of my colleagues, but that five thousand um, dollar principle is um, is kind of general guidance. There are you know discussions that can be had with your program officer as you're planning the report to determine oh this this still makes sense to combine. Um, and as Amy mentions, this isn't under the specific uh, auspices of the CARES Act, so you know we're we're definitely evaluating everything on a case-by-case -case basis with these particular pot of funds. So um, Amy, that's as you kind of get more information or if you have it, you can feel free to reach out to me um, after this and we can maybe develop a plan for how you wanna report that. Um, and Ross has a similar question. So it's, it's definitely more of the um, consult with your program officer because the CARES Act funds are definitely unique um, unique creatures. So <laughs> um, so yeah, I would say that $5,000 rule is, is intended to be a helpful guideline. Um, but if you feel that there's justification for combining subawards that are more than $5,000 each, uh, just talk to us about it. And that way you don't have to go through the process of, you know, shaping up your SPR only for it to might not be um, compatible with what we're looking for. All right, good questions. I appreciate People engaging, that's exciting. <laughs> so speaking of intents, um, for those of you who might be new to the world of the SPR and the world of intents and the world of focal areas, um, this isn't intended to be uh, <laughs> memorized or you know articulated line by line, but it gives you an idea, a top level overview of when we're talking about aligning projects to intents, these are the ones we're talking about. And then in bold, after each intent, we give you um, the focal area that that intent aligns with. So the focal area piece is an FYI, because you'll see the intent selection is what you'll directly in the SPR. Um, so be thinking of that. And I think it is helpful when you're trying to figure out what intent your project aligns with to kind of look at all of them and kind of get a sense of what's the best fit. Obviously, there is it's not a black and white decision every time. Sometimes you, they could, you know, a project could apply to more than one and you just make the best decision with, with which intent most accurately kind of encapsulates the what you're looking for. And um, another area that intents are really important for is that they relate to the crosswalk that you all submitted to us with your five-year plans. So, um, for some of you, especially those of you who might not have been around when the five-year plan was developed, it, it might be a good idea to look at, back at your five-year plan. And if you happen to identify projects in your five-year plan um, that you're planning to report on, then your intent selection might not be that difficult because it might be laid out right there for you. Um, it's okay if, your project, if it's a newer project and it wasn't articulated in your five-year plan, but um, the crosswalk that you all provided still might be a helpful um, starting point when you're trying to figure out which one uh, can, can fit best. 
And so again, just kind of hammering this out a little bit more, uh, there these words can kind of get jumbled up in our vernacular. So there's intense, and then underneath intense, there are subjects. It's like a big Russian doll of, of things. And so the for intense, you only we only want you to select one intent. That is the big encapsulating thing related to your project. But you can select up to two subjects that are under each intent. And so we give this these two examples here because um, we want to remind you that like certain subjects could show up in multiple under multiple intents. So just because you found science, technology, engineering, and math underneath that first intent, improve libraries, physical, and technology infrastructure, that doesn't mean that that's necessarily the intent you have to choose because STEM does show up as a subject under other intents as well. So really just kind of, again, be looking at the large uh, landscape of intents to kind of get a sense of what the best, the best choice would be. So activities. So this is, again, more nesting. We're kind of getting more and more granular. We went from the general overview to the projects. And now underneath projects, there are activities. So a rule of thumb, if you're trying to figure out, should I you know, articulate this part of this project in a fully fledged activity? And a good rule of thumb is that an activity should account for at least 10% of the total amount of resources committed to the project. And resources is a very specific term or a very particular term that we use because it can be actual funding that was committed or it could be um, staff time, which is also, you know, a resource that was committed to the project. So, you know, don't feel like an activity has to necessarily be something that was acquired or something like that. It can be staff time that was dedicated. Um, if it was 10% of the total amount for the project. Um, we do ask that you keep under 10 activities per project. If you're finding that this project is so massive that it might need more than 10 activities, then maybe, and again, this is totally case by case, but it might call you to um, reevaluate and say, oh, maybe, maybe these can be more than one project um, if there are so many activities in the one project. And, uh, the activity title and description should be different and it shouldn't be identical to the project title and description. Now, obviously they'll, um, they'll relate to each other, but like I said earlier, um, they should exist for a unique reason. Uh, and that should be kind of diving more deeply into something that was maybe just alluded to in the um, abstract or some other part of the project descriptions. So here are four, the four, I should say, activity types. So when you get into selecting an activity and you are kind of figuring out, okay, how am I going to organize this project? The activity types and their modes are extremely helpful determining factors, especially if you have a certain type of data related to the project activity and you're trying to figure out how will I report this. The, um, the activity types and their modes um, will give you specific pieces or request specific pieces of data from you, depending on what you choose. So again, I won't go into all, all four of these, but um, what I will say is that uh, procurement is um, intended to be used for um, purchases that don't contain content, if that makes any sense. So they tend to be larger scale purchases, um, especially we see them most often with broadband activities uh, because you're, it's the procurement of, um, of hardware and software that isn't, that isn't loaded with content that's specific to um, a project like apps or software or things like that. And so, um, so keep that in mind when you're deciding uh, which activity to choose more often, especially when we're talking about equipment purchases, we see content acquisition uh, because the con it's the equipment and the laptops, the iPads, et cetera, contain content. And then this is just a quick um, 
because it's just a quick tip and a uh, rule of thumb because it's one of those um, unique situations that we offer a best practice for. But if you have staff attending conferences using the instruction other activity mode because um, the other instruction modes don't exactly fit the activity of um, funding library staff to attend conferences. So we recommend using instruction other. Okay, and now I'm going to hand it over to Michelle who's going to dive even deeper. Hi everyone. There's not too much more. This is an example of activity abstracts. And this person, this was North Carolina, I believe, did one. And you can see it was a literacy project, but the actual activity is called Awesome Alphabet Activities. And it very clearly states what it is. It's a drop-in program. And so the activity they picked here was instruction and the mode was consultation, drop-in, referral. And the format was in person. Um, I will tell you, uh, next slide. Next slide. Okay. Um, a lot of this is, is sounding much more difficult than it is. Most of the time you don't have procurement. Uh, if you do have procurement, it's gonna, it's only gonna come up if you pick institutional capacity as one of the intents. And then those are the three, improving library workforce, physical and technological infrastructure is probably the closest you get to procurement. And I would say, <clears throat> if you're confused, as we have said earlier, call your program officer. <clears throat> as the <clears throat> three examples on the bottom of this slide show, if you're purchasing databases, it's content acquisitions, not procurement. If you're purchasing laptops, that's instruction activities. That's probably one of the biggest areas for new people because laptops are viewed as equipment, but they cost under 5,000. So in federal sense, they're not equipment. So it's instruction activity. And if you're subscribing to a data collection service, that's content creation. Next slide. <clears throat> this is a very good uh, graphic in terms of Dennis mentioned the four activities, instruction, content, planning, and evaluation. Well, we at IMLS ask you to tell us what the outcomes were and whether and to find those out, you survey people. Well, as this graphic shows you, you only have to sur survey people um, four times. The general public only once, and that's for instruction activity. And Library workforce, however, there's three different times when you would survey library workforce staff, and that's for instruction, content, planning, or evaluation. And I would say with some of my people, they say, well, a lot of people, they're survey burnout. And as my Aunt Margaret would say, toughy lucky, uh, you've, got to, uh, you've got to do that because IMLS requires it as part of the grant. And when you think about the fact that you're getting free continuing education, then please fill out the survey. You have to market it to your library staff because you're still gonna be required to do it. Um, next slide. This is again a reminder in the budget section. If you've got conference registrations, list those under the in the services box, not in travel. For apps, software, and licenses, again, it's in the services box, not in supplies and avoid vague descriptions. We used to see a lot of this in the uh, other expenses box. Uh, people don't put things like uh, miscellaneous in there because that makes us question, what did you buy? So don't use that kind of terminology. Next slide. <clears throat> Here's an example of listing budget. Um, the first box, the top box shows you that they spent 15,000 from the LSTA funds and a little over uh, 29,000 in matching funds for the project manager. 25% came out of LSTA as it's described in the description and 50% out of the state matching funds. That is, and notice no names of a person, just their title, that's perfect. In the next example, we see an example of match only funds 
which was over 16,000. And again, here's this, uh, it's for the salary and benefits for the state data coordinator with a description of what that was. Next slide. This is an example of other operational expenses. Some of you have forms that actually say other operational expenses that work for what you're doing at the state. But in terms of the SPR report, other operational expenses usually only comes up for indirect cost items. And, and the two examples at the top, the first one shows database subscriptions. Uh, that should be under uh, uh, services and Postage in the second example should be under supplies. The example without an X is an example of when you would use other operational expenses. And in this case, it was for a state library that gave a subgrant to Mary Mac College, and they used uh, some funds, $665 for indirect cost. If you're unsure about other operational expenses, again, contact your program officer. And I say this for the new LSTA coordinators. Next slide. Additional materials is a section where you can list toolkits. Um, you can get your press releases. This is an example, this Bright Futures of an Idaho report that was done on their summer reading program. We love to see these things because your abstracts tell us only so much, but when you've done a whole report or you've pr produced a toolkit, please provide us with that information. We'd love to see it. We also see examples of the forms you may be using when you survey people or whatever. Uh, next slide. Project tags. Project tags are an option in this system and they're basically, it's cataloging. It's put a word that you think applies to this project. If you're working with veterans, it's nice for you to project tag it and say veterans because that'll tell your colleagues when they search the SBR and IMLS when we search it or the general public because it's open to the public. Oh, LSTA funds have been used for veterans and here's all the states and projects that apply. And you can see examples there for summer uh, meals or make your space activities. Next slide. Match only. A few people have match only projects. Um, you enter it as a regular project, you sign in a tent, you report at least one activity, and the catch is you include match only in the title of the project. Next slide. Project status. The SPR does give you the option that you can change all of your projects at once. Like when you're ready to validate and certify your report, you can change them all from draft to complete it because they have to be in completed status for anything to be validated and certified. So that's a nice shortcut. And you'll see that on the left-hand side of the screen where it says move projects to, where it says status, there's a little box over in the corner there that allows you to change the status. Right now it's showing draft if you click it, it'll all come up to uh, complete it. So you don't have to do them individually. Next slide. There are two other places where you have to put in project information. One is your admin project for your 34% admin uh, that you have, because you could use up to 34%. And the other one is your financial status report. So those are under projects and you see you'll see it's listed there, administrative project, financial status. You click on either box and it will take you to the one that you can fill out. Next slide. And I'm turning it over to Madison. Hey y'all, I'm back. Closing us out. So. Uh, once you have completed your projects, it comes time to certify your report. And in certifying the SPR, there are some critical points to remember. Uh, only the chief can certify your report. LSTA coordinators can validate reports um, to head off any error messages, uh, but the chief will still need to certify and they'll to validate is sort of the same uh, sequence of actions as it will take 
to certify. So uh, first certification uh, for this year will be for the final reports for 2019 projects and the final FSR and admin project. Um, you'll go into the SPR and under projects, select certify reports in the menu, and then the chief will be prompted to re-enter their password. Uh, you can ensure that uh, the certification actually went through by checking the project status under list projects and it'll say certified. Or you can also check by looking at the certification fields in the FSR. And once that's certified, uh, that should contain the name of the chief uh, who certified it and the date stamp that they certified. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. All right, so the second part is uh, certifying your interim FFR, uh, and that is a separate thing you have to do in addition to certifying your final reports. Um, this often, for us, falls through the cracks, and so we'll have to come back and, and tell you to certify that to follow up. Um, but again, the chief is the one who, who can only certify uh, to do this in the SPR, you'll click on the financial status report and then interim FFR and then certify. Uh, and you can ensure the certification went through by looking at the certification fields in the S interim FFR and it will contain the name and the date stamp of the chief who certified it. And next slide, please. Cool. Just some general reminders overall. If you'd like to play around with the SPR, get to know it a little bit better, you can use the Sandbox. It is available for practicing and training, uh, and we have the link here. And for all of you, uh, all reporting deadlines are at the end of December. Final reports include all projects and the final FSR, and then the interim uh, financial, uh, federal financial report is also due, which is for the following year. Um, and all of our resources are in our Grants to States manual, um, and we keep those up to date pretty regularly. So please feel free to check out that link. I know we have some questions, but here are the lists of all of us if you ever need to get in touch with us. Nadis, right. yes. just forgot something. Uh, I said indirectly 34% uh, for admin. I meant 4% for admin. Sorry about that confusion. <clears throat> yes. We just want to make sure I everybody was paying that. attention. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Cindy had a question about the number of tags that we can list per project. Oh, yes. My knowledge is there are no limits, but Terry. Do you know if we have a limit to the number of tags? I don't know. I don't think there's a hard limit in the system. I think there might be a guideline in the state program requirements document, and I think it might be in the range of three as a like kind of stopping point. But we're not going to send it back if you have five, so it'll be fine. All right. We did have someone ask about the controlled vocabulary around whether IMLS has um, a you know, specific list. I will say the reason we have project tags is just the extra on top of all the other controlled vocabulary that we have. So we have subject tags that are controlled and we have intents and focal areas. And then the, the search function within the public view will also pick up any keywords from abstracts and titles. So really the idea of the project tags was to sort of provide a unified glance across the states for things that might be using different terminology. We had a long list at one point, uh, maybe a dozen terms. I think we need to revisit them. But right now, like the word making is helpful to us because people talk about maker spaces or hacker spaces or different things that kind of embody making, but we've put the term making together just to like help us search it as an agency. Veterans are still of interest to us. Summer meals are still of interest to us, but um, this is not a hard and fast controlled vocabulary at this time. I, I would say too that 
a number of states are no longer calling their library for the blind and physically handicapped the library for the blind and physically handicapped. And, and in the entire abstract, you don't see any reference to, let's say, a person who's blind. So you might want to put that word as a project tag, just as a, an identifier if someone was looking for that and was unaware that you're calling it the ABLE library or something else. And it's good for new terminology that comes up. That's why we, you know, all of a sudden there's something people are doing and it's a new term in the library field. We have a, a couple more questions. Uh, Marla from New Mexico is asking and confirming that for the FFR for FY20, we only report what was reported, um, what was spent by September 30th. And that's correct. Unless you have an extension. True. For those of you who have extensions, let me know if you have questions, because they're all my state. <laughs> Okay, well, I know we're like right at the hour, so we're going to cut this recording off now, but if you reach out to your program officers, and thank you so much for being with us today. We will send the slides and the recording out um, once they're posted on our website. It may take a little time, but we'll be in touch. Everyone, have a